So, the Navier-Stokes equations, conceptualised all the way back in the early 1800s, has developed to become one of the most important equations across science and engineering in present day, holding a coveted place alongside its close contemporaries of ingenious human thought, like calculus, dealing with infinitesimally small changes, and classical mechanics, governing the motion of physical objects. At its core, Navier-Stokes describes and models the flow of fluids. Depending on the form of the equations, this fluid could be anything really, like water flowing down a river, predicting flow of air for the weather forecast, or even more complex fluids like plasma inside a nuclear fusion reactor, or blood flow through an artificial heart valve. An exact solution set to Navier-Stokes has not yet been shown, and in fact the equations belong to the Millennium Prize problems, carrying a million dollar prize to whoever can further our understanding of them. Now this video won't focus as much on lengthy derivations and deep philosophy, instead I'm looking to give you an intuitive appreciation of Navier-Stokes, with emphasis on how they could be applied and solved in technological situations. So here are the Navier-Stokes equations. Three time dependence equations, one for each coordinate direction, x, y, and z, that describes the transport and conservation of momentum in a fluid. Now, we typically write these a bit more simply using vector calculus operators like Nabla, Divergence, Curl, Laplacian. Anyway, those are for another video. All we are actually doing here is applying a form of Newton's second law of motion, f equals ma, to a small element of fluid in our flow. There are a few typical assumptions we need to impose, however. Notably, our fluid is isothermal, that is, it's a constant temperature. Our fluid is incompressible, that is, its volume doesn't change no matter how strong of a pressure we apply. Our fluid is viewed as being one continuous medium instead of individual particles, and that our fluid is Newtonian. In other words, on the molecular scale, a flowing fluid can be viewed as layers of molecules, and as the fluid flows these layers slide over one another, exerting shear stresses on each other. A Newtonian fluid is where the shear stress between layers is equal to the viscosity times the velocity gradient, where this gradient is perpendicular to the flow direction. Now going back to Newton's law, the forces acting on this cube can be internal or external. Internal forces from within the fluid might be shear stresses from viscosity, External forces might be a pressure gradient. Think of when you blow up a balloon, the air pressure inside is greater than the outside, and then when you let the balloon go, there's a pressure gradient causing air to flow out, propelling the balloon forwards. Other examples include gravity, or even electrical and magnetic forces for charged fluids like plasma. For that though, we must combine Navier-Stokes with Maxwell's equations which describe the behaviour of magnetic and electric fields, and this gives a subject called magnetohydrodynamics. Where we can even model the motion of things like spiral galaxies. Anyways, going back to our original equation, our most important variable is the velocity field, u. It is a vector field, where every point in 3D space has a vector associated with it, possessing a varying magnitude and direction. The idea is when we solve Navier-Stokes, we obtain the velocity field, so we know how the fluid is moving everywhere in our system. Now, after some nifty equation formulating, we produce the results we saw moments ago, where we can clearly see our viscosity term, our pressure gradient, and other external forces like gravity. And then there's our density and what we call a convective derivative, which long story short describes how momentum is transported by our flow with both time and space. Now, under simplified systems, it's actually possible to solve the Navier-Stokes equations exactly. For example, in a channel microelectrode, if we apply some simplifications, where we can assume the flow is single directional without turbulence, we can arrive at a parabolic velocity profile. This becomes particularly relevant as the transport of chemical species to the electrode surface affects how much current is produced, meaning local variations in current generation might be expected. 
or if we had a concentric cylindrical reactor. For this, we need to use Navier-Stokes in cylindrical polar coordinates. Now, this is basically a fancier way of describing a point in 3D space. Before, we've used x, y, and z, whereas now we use a radial distance from the origin, an angle, and the z coordinate. And yes, this results in a slightly different form for Navier-Stokes, but the underlying physical reasoning does not change. If we assumed purely angular flow, without turbulence, we can simplify to obtain the angular velocity profile this time. And all of a sudden, if I started throwing in chemical reactions into the picture, like polymer processing, where the flow pattern helps achieve the desired molecular alignment or orientation of the polymer chains, then the mass transport of reactants and chemicals from the velocity field is important. Polymerization can also be exothermic, meaning our fluid may no longer be isothermal, and the fluid physical properties will vary with the local temperature as well. Now, you're probably wondering, real-life situations rarely lead to such simplified geometric setups a lot of the time. So how do we end up, well, predicting the weather forecast? Well, one method is computational fluid dynamics. A lot of such algorithms rely on discretization, where we simplify derivatives as the division of the change in two quantities between two discrete points in space. We can then construct a grid of points where we want to find our velocity field. This grid doesn't have to be uniform, so regions where we expect large velocity field changes need more points, and this is analogous, if you like, to your grid having a higher resolution. We can then use discretization to simplify Navier-Stokes into an iterative equation. So if we know the velocity, at a particular point, we continually iterate until our velocity field has been generated. Even with this though, modelling chaotic turbulent flows is an especially big pain. In many cases, one gets highly volatile behaviour, with a small change in starting velocities causing an unrealistically large change to the output, and this is also partly why it's impossible to have accurate weather predictions too far in advance. We would essentially need accurate evolving pictures of the pressure and temperature fields, and a small inaccuracy could cause a large change to the final solution. Most of the headache is caused by the convection term, which makes the equations non-linear, and non-linear in layman's terms tends to mean really hard to solve. And unfortunately, non-linearity tends to crop up a lot in real-life situations, not just in fluids, but also in quantum mechanics, or the stock market, and so on. So that concludes your Navier-Stokes snapshot and how it can be used to model real-world processes. If you enjoyed this video, please do consider sharing to anyone who might be interested.